How could a God like that... Did that give you goosebumps, by the way? Yes. Okay. How could a God that created the universe... How could a God that created this oxygen that we're breathing, that we can't even see... How could this God that created the stars and the universe around us, how could a God that sent his only son to this earth to live among men, which ultimately with the purpose of that to die on a cross, a torture tool, and he died on there and rose again, and still to me, how could a God like that love me? I know me. You know you. And sometimes, yes, we love, each, we love ourselves. But if we sat down and really say, do you deserve the love of God? The answer is what? No. no. Today, when I'm standing up here, I don't deserve to be up here. My past was a religious past. And I played church. I did church for a very long time. I was a missionary kid for crying out loud. Southeast Asia for 16 years of my life. If anyone was to come to know Jesus, hear the gospel of Jesus over and over and over again, it was me. It wasn't until later on within those 16 years that I gave my life to Christ. I said, you know what? I don't deserve it, but I'll take it. I don't deserve that love, but I will accept it. I don't deserve it, but if it says so, it must be true. And as soon as that day happened, I was just the most perfect person in the world, right? You know me too well. But the, the crazy thing is, I, I think that's how we think. I think, how could a loving, true, graceful God love us? Have you ever had that thought before? How could God love you? Have you ever had that thought? How could a God use you? You know your past. God knows your past. God knows the things you're doing today that you know you're not, you're not supposed to do. So how could a loving God use you? And the answer is, He does. 100,000 million percent, the answer is, yes, God loves you. 100,000 million percent is He wants to use you. And today we're going to talk about a Christmas story. About those people who in society was the last, but God came to them, what? First. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. If you are visiting with us for the very first time, let me tell you this. There is a Bible on, on your seat. It's a red Bible, and it's yours to keep. It's your Bible to keep. Take it home with you, our gift. If you don't have a Bible of your own, now if you have three or four Bibles of your own, leave it there for somebody else. But if you don't have, say, this version, or you don't have a Bible, take it home, please. Take it home. Luke chapter 2, in verse 8, is the most incredible story of, of, of angel encounters. We have all heard this story, so when I read it, it's not going to be unique. But what I want it to do is be real. That makes sense? Uh, here at Catalyst Church, we want you, when you open up the Bible, not just to read something and say, boy, you read something, but we want you to read it, and we want the pages and the words of God to jump out at you and say, wow, that's true. Wow, that's for me. You with me? So let's enter this realm of truth. Let's enter this realm of this is for you and this is for me, and allow God's word to jump out at you even though it's the Christmas story you've heard your entire life. Sound good? All right. Luke chapter 2, starting verse 8, and it says this, And there were shepherds living. Pause. Hold the story. Shepherds. 
Shepherds. <laughs> what's, what's about to happen? Who's going to show up to the shepherds? You can talk to me. Who's going to show up to the shepherds? Angels. Angels are going to show up to the shepherds and say, check it out. Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. 400 years of silence. Thousands of years of saying the Messiah is going to come. And all of a sudden, the angels appear to the who? Shepherds. <laughs> to the shepherds? Shepherds. They live around poop. They live around stinky, nasty, dumb sheep. They live under the stars of the sky because that's their job. Their job was the lowest scumly thing of the world at, at that time. They were out. They didn't even have a house. And they would be gone for many, many months at a time. Tending the sheep of the rich. Tending the sheep so that the wool will grow. That the, they'll go find places to eat. They were in society the lowest of the low. They were forgotten for months at a time. And as long as the sheep are taken care of, they get a paycheck. And the Bible talks many, many times about sheep. And by the way, sheep are stupid animals. If they see a sheep jump off a cliff, if it's the lead sheep, what are the sheep going to do? Jump off the cliff. They're not the most hygiene-focused animals. They have the, their wool. And whatever they decide to sit down in, poop, would stay in the wool for a very long time. And here are these shepherds, that the glory of God is about to show up to these shepherds. And I'm here to tell you this, it doesn't make sense. If I was God, Lord help the world. If I wanted to get the gospel or Jesus out and say, the Messiah is finally here. It's been prophesied for thousands of years. I've been silenced for 400 years. And now, boom shakalaka, Jesus is here. If I was God, I'd be like, check it out. Let's have a press conference. I'm going to go to Obama and say, Obama, check it. Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. He's going to save the world and famine health and everything. We're going to sing Kumbaya until forever and ever because he's here. But thank God I'm not God. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but God came to the lowest. He came to the lowest because he loves everyone. And today he's here for you, the lowest in society, maybe the richest in society, but he's here for you. So to answer the question is, does he come and does he use and does he love everyone? The answer is what? Yes. Absolutely. The first, write this down, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And I love it how God didn't come to the king. Actually, the king ended up putting a death threat on Jesus' lives and annihilating the children at that time. I'm looking around the room, and I know many of you guys. I know many of you guys' stories. And I see some people that society has brushed aside. I see some people right here that you have brushed your own abilities and gifts to the side and said, how could a God love me? That's probably the number one question that I get. How could a God love me? Look at the shepherds. He set up tradition all throughout his life. And that's just the character of God. Here's some proven facts. There's some others that are in the Bible. For example, there's one person called Moses. Anybody not heard of Moses? Moses took a million or so people out of where? Egypt. Say Egypt. Egypt. 
Okay. History lesson for you from the Bible. Okay. Took all million people out of Egypt and brought them to a water, um, a, a river. And they, they were stuck right there. And all of a sudden, God said, all right, let's, let's make sure we divide this water so that they can get across. Because who's behind them? The Egyptian army is about to whoop some tail. So he sticks his rod in, or his staff in it, and all of a sudden, this huge wave like that. It would have been awesome to go see it. I mean, movies don't, don't even do it justice. So he parts this water, and he walks on what? Dry land. And walks across this amazing man of God who God used. But did you know that Moses had an extreme speech impediment? In, in, Mo, in this passage, it says in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, this is at the burning bush. It says, Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. In other words, he said, hold on. <laughs> you want me to do what? And God said, I want to use you for this huge purpose. And Moses was coming up with all the lame but excuses in the world. And this is one, and this is true. It says, pardon, pardon your interruption. No, hold on, hold on. I have never been eloquent, neither, neither in the past nor since have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And here is Moses, not very good with his words, going in front of Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. And God used him in some mighty, mighty ways. Isn't that pretty cool? Yes. All right. So if you don't speak well, me... God can still use you. Oh, King David. Oh, King David. We just went through a Bible study with the men for about 15 weeks. King David. Wasn't that it? awesome, guys? Yeah. All right. Sounds good. In other words, teaser. Come in January. Another great Bible study for men and women. But it says this. Uh, David, was he the most attractive man in the world? The answer is no. He wasn't very tall. His outside appearance wasn't much. And all of a sudden, Samuel said, hey, here's all your, here's all your brothers. And, and all the brothers were saying, you know what? Yes, I am going to be the next king. Yes, Samuel's here to talk to me. And God says, no, 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 no. He says this, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have what? Rejected him. The Lord does not look on the things that people look at. By the way, if you would give that tattoo to your body, the amazing, awesome things would happen. If you just memorize that, the Lord does not look at the things as people look at. That will just preach by itself. It? Underline that. It's awesome. People look at the what? Outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. And who was David? He was a little what boy? Shepherd boy. Isn't that awesome? Again, the lowest of lows. And his father said, oh, I've got, I've got another son. <laughs> He's David. Um, you sure? I mean, he'd probably freak some people out if he came. I and mean, he's a little punk boy. But God said, yes. So if you're not the best looking person in society, God still wants to use you. Forget what other people say. Your looks were given to you by who? And God does not screw up. There's a great, by the way, read uh, um, Judges chapter 3, 12 through 30. One of my greatest heroes of the Bible, his name was Ehud. Have you ever heard of Ehud? Probably not. Ehud's awesome. Ehud was a left-handed man. And left-handed men were actually put aside because uh, you want to use your what hand? Right hand. Back in that culture, when Ehud was there, and even still today, my, my son is left-handed. Heaven forbid my son's left-handed. And I said, son, use your right hand. And he's like, no, use your right hand so I don't bump your elbow when I'm eating. Um, okay. <laughs> so even back then, the left-handed people were, were kind of like pushed aside and said, you must not be blessed by God if you're left-handed. So here's Ehud, a left-handed man, he went in, and you have to read the story. He was awesome. He was one of the judges in the Bible. And he went up to this, this king called Eglon. He's a big, huge, fat, like 1,700-pound guy, king. And he, he came in there. Um, this cool story. He stabbed him to death. And it talked about how he stabbed him with his left hand because he had hidden his dagger on his, on his, on his right side because everybody, all the guards checked the other side. Are you with me? 
He killed a huge fat king and was used by God even though he was what? Left-handed. Stories go on. Peter was, was a man that was an idiot, one of the disciples, the apostles. Oh, by the way, Peter wasn't a very smart man. He didn't have very much common sense at all. People are coming to attack Jesus. This huge guard coming to get Jesus. And all of a sudden, Peter jumps up and says, fight! And he, he's terrible. I mean, if you wanted to stab, I, even I know, stab like this. But he goes, ah! And he cuts off a dude's ear. Okay? And Jesus is like, you idiot, Peter. Dave's vernacular. You idiot, Peter. You just get behind me, stupid. Here's your ear back. <laughs> Alright? So Peter. But this is what Jesus says about Peter. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I tell you that you, Peter, you idiot, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. If it wasn't Peter's dedication to Jesus, we, as a church, would not be in existence. God used an idiot person to use to start the church. Isn't that awesome? Is that cool? Okay. So how about you? I'm going to pick on some of you for a second. Is that okay? <laughs> Whatever. All right. So if you don't want to share, you don't have to share. By the way, when you come up, um, if I call you out, um, if you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand. So I have to preface all that to say your secrets are between you and God and, and whoever else. But if you want to... Just raise your hand you can. Raise your hand if you've ever been to jail or prison for an extended period of time. Raise your hand. Jail or prison for an extended period of time. All right. Let's see here. Charles, come on up here. Come on up here. Everybody say hi to Charles. All right, Charles, go and take a seat right here. Yeah, that's... All right, Charles is an example of everyone in this room or anybody on the face of the planet that has ever been to jail or prison. By the way, Charles just got out of prison uh, last Friday. Last Friday, is that right? Halfway house, whatever. Uh, um, about like five or about a week ago. And he's been with us the entire time. He's our part of our family. Isn't that awesome? All right, good time. Okay. So Charles represents all the, all the prison jail people in here and the world. Are you with me? Okay. Let me ask you, who has ever, and again, you don't have to share, but if it's part of your testament, who has ever committed adultery in this room? All right? All right? Who was that hand there? All right? All right. Come on up, my friend. Come on up. All right? Going to introduce yourself real quick. This is Brian. Brian Hess. Everybody say hi, Brian. Hi. All right. Going to take a seat right there. Okay, Brian. Um, you've committed adultery? Okay. So Brian represents all those in the world and within our church that have committed adultery. Okay. Got it? We got people representing to, who went to where? Prison. People who have committed adultery. Now, this is, this is, this is the one. Who has ever been extremely addicted to drugs or alcohol before? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Let's see. Okay. All right, Eddie, come on up. Take a seat right there. Everybody say hi to Eddie. Hi. All right. Eddie's awesome. And pray for his wife. She's kind of sick today. So come on up, my friend. So Eddie represents anybody in this room that has been addicted to drugs or alcohol or, or whatever, all right? If you, and by the way, you're going to hear um, stories with these guys. We're going to go back to do these one-day videos, or they're awesome. Okay. Who's ever um, said that they, and I don't, I don't know, I'm, this might be the case. Who's ever said that they have been a devout atheist before? Devout atheist. All right. Come on up, my friend. Come on up. All right, introduce yourself. Hi. All right, Gracie, go and take a seat. Everybody say hi, Gracie. Hi. All right. Actually, I used to drive a school bus for R84, and she was my student. Now she's here. Isn't that awesome? All right, great. All right, so, all right, so she represents anybody on the face of the planet that has classified themselves as the devout atheist, agnostic, or whatever. You with me? All right. Now I need, now this, this one, I mean, you don't have to share, but if it's part of your testimony, be, be proud of it if you want to say, who's ever in your childhood or recently, whatever, been sexually abused? Okay. All right. 
Let's see. Aaron, come on up. Everybody say hi to Aaron. Hi. All right. This is like an AA class. This is great. This is, hi, Aaron. All right. Come on up, my dear. So Aaron represents all those on the face of the planet and here who have been sexually abused. All right. Then the last one, who's ever been homeless for six months or longer? All right. So George, come on up, my friend. All right. So George is, everybody say hi to George. All right. George represents all of those in this room or people that you know that have been homeless um, for their entire or for uh, six months or more. So, all right, George, go ahead and take a seat. The people you see in front of you guys are people that society says cannot be used. One of my biggest pet peeves with, say, the first one is in prisons. They get out of prison. Charles just just recently got out of the system and now if he tries to apply even to McDonald's they're probably going to turn him away even though we know Charles has come and to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and God is going to use him in some mighty ways Charles in God's eyes is valuable all right he is all right Absolutely. All right. In society, we get someone who has had an affair. Let's pause. Within churches, if affairs have been started, if affairs have been going on, and affairs have been a part of their life, churches say, I don't want anything to do with him or her because of the affair. Don't even get near them because they're going to rub off on me and ooey gooey. Now, each of these situations are sinful situations, but I know Brian. I know his wife. But I do know this. Brian is loved by the God, the Creator of God, but in society and within churches, he's an outcast. You with me? Isn't it awesome that a God could come to someone who's had an affair and say, I love you. Turn your life around. Let's go. Then we've got someone who's been addicted to, to um, was it just drinking or drugs too? Everything, okay, all right. So you've got someone in society that has been, um, uh, has been an extreme alcoholic, who's, who's been a, a, a druggie, who's been through the whole gamut. And in society, we said, don't come near me. Don't come around me. God cannot use you, Eddie. According to society and churches, God cannot use you. I think that's a bunch of bull crap. I know this for a fact. Eddie just recently got baptized, probably about a month ago. And he, I can't get him away from a Bible study. All right? Good. And then Gracie, we've got someone who has been um, a devout atheist. And she said, you know what? I don't want anything to do with God. God cannot exist. Um, it's just about the karma in this world. And, and here she is, sitting in church. She actually came over to my house with Deja and watched my kids. Heaven forbid an atheist comes to my house and watch my children. What is she going to teach him? What is she going to pollute? No. But check this out. God loves her very much. All right? They've got Aaron. Aaron represents people who have been sexually abused. She's got a hurt past. If she would tell you her story, it would bring tears to your eyes. But she is here, loved by the most precious father ever. And because of her love for the father and the father's love for her, here she is today serving a part of our first impressions, bringing gifts in. And society says, you know what? You are a mental, physical wreck. Nothing can be used in your life. I beg to differ. God loves her and wants to use her so very, very much. Now we've got George. George has been homeless before for a very extended period of time. And we know George's story, some of you guys. And George, um, he loves God very much. 
And God loves him even though he might not have a dollar bill. Or maybe he might be a millionaire. It doesn't matter. But God loves him. When George was at his lowest of lows without even a house to live in, God said, I love you. I care for you. I love you so much that I sent my son to die for you, homeless man. And there's hundreds of other stories and stereotypes that we can mention that society pushes to, pushes to the ground. And churches push aside. And I'm here to tell you, that's not my God. My God came to the shepherds. My God came to the shepherds and said the following. Keep your Bibles. You guys stay up here for a second. This is what, this, this is what God said. In verse 8 it says this. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were what? Terrified. Terrified. Duh. All of a sudden, they're like getting ready for bed, pulling up their like little blankies and everything. And all of a sudden, the angel appears to them. They were terrified. But this is what the angel said. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you what? Good news. And I'll pause here. When Jesus Christ revealed himself to these people, he came up to them and said, I've got good news for you. Don't be afraid. I've got great news for you. Don't be afraid. I've got great news for each and every one of you. Don't be afraid. And this is what it, this is this is our our testimony. This is God testimony. Were we scared to receive Christ? Absolutely. But at least it's something great, and we'll talk about that in a second. He came to these shepherds. And said the following, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. And that will be, uh, that will be to all people. What people? All. all people. Does that mean these society outcasts? Absolutely. Absolutely. Bring it on! Okay. All right. <laughs> Today in the town of David, a Savior is born to you. He is Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you that you'll find him a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in the manger. Um, and lying in the manger. All of a sudden, I love that. Angel, just yeah, again, be a part of the story. So you got the shepherds, and then all of a sudden you've got one angel said, Check it out, got some great story. Don't be afraid, I'm only an angel, but I bring you great story, some great news with great joy, and this will be a sign to you as soon as the angel talk, starts talking about Jesus. As soon as the angel starts talking about Jesus, these angels, I can just imagine in heaven, I can just, just um, imagine with me. They sent Gabriel down, and the angel's like, dude, I want to go. I want to tell the people about Jesus. So the multitude that are hidden in heaven or in a fourth dimension or whatever, Gabriel comes and to the shepherds and says, check it, got good news. Got great news for you. Then all of a sudden, he starts talking about who? Jesus. He starts talking about baby Jesus. And then the heavenly host, it's like, it's like, um, it's like, like meat and hound dogs everywhere. Oh, Got to get there. Got to get there. So they're, they're so excited. Just imagine with me. All of a sudden, a great company. In other words, lots and lots and lots of angels. If God really wanted to, us to know how many billions of angels or whatever there are, do you think he would have shared it? But he didn't want to overdo us. So he just said a great company of angels of heavenly hosts appeared to the angel appeared with the angel and then they said praise God praising God and said glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men whom his what favor rests these angels were so excited. They were jumping at the moment. As soon as God opens up the floodgates, the angels, heavenly hosts, appeared to the shepherds, the useless society outcasts, and said, glory to God in the highest. Peace be to you and all people. The heavenly hosts came 
in multitude to the shepherds. Point two is this. The proclamation of Jesus leads to worship. Whenever, let me, let me add this, there's a question. And tell me the truth, if, if it's not the truth. Charles, when you had, when you started your relationship with Christ, when you heard about Jesus and you took him and, and accepted that call into your life, did it lead to some sort of a weeping or crying or just a praise and say, hey, he loves me? All right. What's that? Peace. Ah, what does it say? The what? Peace on earth. Okay, good. All right, felt peace. Good. All right, absolutely. Absolutely. You cried? Okay. Ball like a baby. The emotions of Jesus' announcement to their life and all of our lives has to lead to worship. Has to lead to God loves me enough that no matter what me, I, we have done, it deserves worship. That's why last week I said, don't just come to, come to the church. Don't go moping around. Life, what did I say? Heavy, hard, heavy word, and I used it. Life, what's at times? Sucks at times. It really does. But it doesn't mean that we should not worship with the pure joy and glory because God sent His only Son to us. To us. And if that doesn't lead you to worship, someone's got a problem. All right. All right, so glory to God in the highest. Peace on And then it says, so point 15 is, or not, verse 14. Um, write this down real quick. It says this. Oh, I, let me go, go back, go back. This is a great verse. Luke 15, verse 10. Put that up there, Nate. It says this. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels over, uh, of God over one sinner who repents. You got that? Let me read this again. If this doesn't give you goosebumps, I don't know what will. Are you ready for the goosebumps? Let me read it. In the same way, I tell you, there is, there was rejoicing in the presence of God over you and you coming to know Jesus. The angels that went, the choirs that went out and said, glory to God in the highest, this is probably the same angel said, finally they got it. They stopped making excuses. They brought joy into their life. Which leads to amazing, amazing, amazing worship in heaven. And I'm here to tell you, Catalyst Church, that, that I have the opportunity to lead people to Christ. It's awesome. But as soon as someone raises their hand during our invitation time, and we hear that someone has truly come to know Christ, we, would have, we should be clapping. Because there's angels clapping up in heaven. And guess what? The angels don't have... Jesus to die for them. Jesus died for us human beings. They did not die for the angels. And if the angels can say glory to God in the highest, we should daily say life sucks, but glory to God in the highest. You with me? All right. Last point is this. Point three, transformed lives lead to immediate action. Before I read it, let me ask you. I'm oh, sorry, on this side. All right. Um, and if it's not true, it might not be true for you. So, George, as soon as you took in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you made him legit in your life, did you want to go tell somebody? All right. There's just something inside of you that says, this is good. This is for me. This is forgiveness for me. And I want, oh, did you know? No? Let me tell you. Please do. Okay. All right. Aaron, same way? Definitely. Absolutely. Was that? You told everyone. All right. Good. <laughs> good, good, good. Charles? Okay. Listen, that's where we're missing this. The joy that we had at the beginning of our salvation should be continuing over and it should lead our transformed lives should lead to immediate action and that action should not stop. 
that our action of telling other people about Jesus and our story should continue to go and go and go. Check this out. These people and all of you who have been transformed because of Jesus, the result being you can relate to the prisoners. And you can tell them about Jesus. You have an in with the prisoners more than a religious child person could, right? Same thing. You could go and, hey, I've had an affair before, but Jesus Christ came in. He rocked my world, and, hey, it's not worth it anymore. Hey, drugs aren't worth it. Drugs and alcohol, that's not going to fill the void. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Atheists, hey, you know what? I used to not believe, but my life has been changed because of Jesus. Right, we got someone who's sexually abused and said, I've been abused by my father, my, my boyfriend, my whatever. I've been sexually abused. But all I know is my father, God, has forgiven me and wants to use me. And he wants to use you. Homeless person. Someone on the face of the planet that society says no. God says, you know what? I love you so very much. And George has and continue will be able to tell the homeless people, says, I can relate to you. Transform lives lead to or result in immediate action of telling other people about Jesus. Verse 15 it says, When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds went back to sleep and waited till the morning. Is that what it said? Okay. All right. They immediately shared. When, okay, let's go to Bethlehem, they said. They left, when they left heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see the things that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they walked slowly. What did they say? They hurried. There was an action step. There was an immediate, like, just an urgency to, to tell people, to go see, to experience Jesus, let us go to Bethlehem and see what, have, what, what the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who were lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about him, about the child. And all who heard it were what? Amazed at what the shepherd said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things. And pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. There was an immediate action step. And I think that's the problem with the church. We accept, receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We get all excited for the first year, month, week. Then all of a sudden, we lose our joy that's there and turn our attention to all the chaos of the world. And we stop looking at Jesus. Let me tell you this. This is straight from the angel's mouth. If that's you, or if you're a broken person and said, how could a God love me? If you are one of these, or maybe you're another person in society, how could God love you? You're afraid of taking that step? You're afraid of telling other people about Jesus? This is what the angel says in Luke 2, verse 10. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all people.